Hi, I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. If you're watching this on Gary Knoll YouTube or on Rumble or Odyssey, I always try to bring you like a classroom on the air. One topic, a little more in-depth, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. All of this is meant to help you live a longer and healthier life. But today it's not about the nutrients. It's not about the diet. It's about something that I found more profound. But to understand what I'm about to share with you, how to live a longer life, how to prevent disease, and how to overcome disease if you are sick, you have to understand what goes into it. I call it the five principles of healing or succeeding or happiness. What are those five principles? One, be in the right place at the right time. Two, be there with the right idea. Have an idea that's yours, something you really believe in, something you thought of. Three, have the right support system. Surround yourself or seat people who will support you in your idea, whatever it may be, even in a relationship. Four, also be the right person, meaning don't be allowing whatever doesn't work in your life or the dark side of your existence, your limitations, limit what you're doing. And last, make sure it's the right time. So right place, right time, right idea, right support system, be the right person. Those are the five principles. Now, how does it work? Well, let's go back to the early 1970s. And I was trying to find out as a young researcher, scientist, the Institute of Applied Biology, and a dietitian and a nutritionist. Why is it there were people living around the world living longer lives, healthier lives than we in the United States, yet they didn't have vitamins to take. They didn't have a Pilates class. They didn't have a yoga class. They didn't have some form of talk therapy. It was very popular back then. Well, then how'd they do it? And... I decided the only way I'd know this is over a period of years, it took five years, I would go out, visit a place, and come back. Go out to another place, went to the jungles of Brazil in the rainforest, because I heard there were people there who were living much longer lives than people in Brazil living in the cities. I, you know, I I spoke with and met with the emir of, of Hunza, the ruler of Hunza's family, and uh, that was just before... There was a road going to be built right through the Himalayas, right through their country. And these were the descendants of those who left Alexander the Great's army and when he was in India. And they were kind of like a lost civilization. In fact, the movie, Lost Civilization, uh, or Lost Horizons, anyhow, it was a 1930s film uh, where they ended up in, a, I believe it was a plane crash, and they ended up in this valley up in the mountains, and it was just like a utopia. That's a real place. There are about 70,000 people living uh, as Hunzas, what they call the Hunzakut. When I first met with the King's family, I had a radio show on WMCA, and we would do programs on trying to get some activity going to prevent that road going from Pakistan, because they knew that once that road went through their country, all the diseases, all of the politics would follow, and it would destroy their country. And indeed, that's exactly what happened in no small measure. In any case, I found that they used fasting a lot. In fact, he said, look, we're living at 8,000, 10,000, 12,000 feet, and uh, nothing grows during the, a lot of the winter. So when things are growing, we have very rich soil, we have to store them, you know, apricots and, and apples and raisins and figs, and etc. cetera. And, uh, and each morning we have a very healthy drink. It was a key for drink made from uh, goat's milk or other milk, uh, non-cow milk. And that's rich in probiotics. Indeed, it was. Before anyone anywhere was talking about probiotics, good for your gut and good for your immune system, they were talking about this in the early 1970s. And they've been doing this for over 2,000 years. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Mm. So then um, that gave me some idea that, okay, Fermented products and the diet. The Japanese have been doing it with their misos and tempehs and the Chinese as well. But then they they emphasized a lot of the green vegetables. 
and exercise was very important. They had no currency. They had no jails. Why? Because they had no crime. You were asked not to get married to after you were 30 years of age. And you studied, you studied the traditions where you had people, the elders, would help solve conflicts if there was conflicts. So people didn't have weapons. They didn't need them. Mainly they were farmers and they were real masters of it. And so they said in the springtime, they would fast sometimes for two, three weeks on just kefir drinks and whatever dried fruit they had left over and nuts and seeds until the new crops came in. So they were the first to really do, on a real serious level, intermittent fasting. So that was something I learned. But the most important thing I learned in the, from the Hunza and also from people elsewhere in Trinidad, in the mountains of Jamaica, the Blue Mountains, <clears throat> in uh, Venezuela, and other places that I traveled to in the countryside in Scotland and Ireland and France and England, all around, I found that the single most important thing to their health was their sense of purpose. What was the meaning and purpose of their life? And who was there to help them through the transitions that we all go through? Indeed, there was a time in the United States throughout our history where the family was very important throughout your whole life. And so people had large families in no small measure because the older people would have someone younger helping them through their own life. And people didn't retire historically. They just kept doing what they could do until they passed. So when I traveled around and I went down to Jamaica and I really hit home in Jamaica, I was up in between Montego Bay and another place, plantation. And I noticed on Sunday morning, everybody was dressed in their best clothing and the whole families everywhere were walking off to the local church. And I hadn't seen that in a long time. Yes, people go to church. But I asked some of the people, could I sit with them and talk with them? They were very open about it. I said, what's the single most important thing in your life? And this woman laughed and said, my family. You know, my daughters, my sons, my grandchildren. I look forward to that, being with them, sharing all the different moments of life. And then they get into how they, they prepare a person for every transition and passage. We don't. The nuclear family is, is no longer able to do that. There are just too many distractions. Go into the average person's home in the evening and they're all out somewhere, or if they're there, they're all on their little gizmos looking at messages but they're not talking with one another. They're not sharing their experiences of the day. And that's what all these other cultures do. They share the meaning of their, their day. And in every single culture I went to in the world, every single one, no exceptions, and it's also true today, the oldest person becomes the person that guides the knowledge and resolves the conflict. They call them wise men, wise women, wise elders. And so the younger people always knew there was someone that they could talk with, no matter what the issue was, who would understand them. And that gave them strength. So imagine the different passages of life when you're getting out of school and you have your first little heartbreaks and, and, and then someone's there to let you know that that's just at the beginning of life and you'll have a lot of different experiences, but it's not the end of anything. It's the beginning of maturing when you're out of college, when you're going to college, what are you going to learn? Why? And because the whole purpose of going to college is to learn skills you can use within your community, in your life, that will sustain you in a job. And if you can't go to college, then what crafts will you learn? And who teaches you? The older people. And so all over the world, everyone knew how to do things, and multiple things, because they couldn't afford to have someone come in and fix something for them. And then I'm thinking, wow, I grew up in a small community in Parkersburg, West Virginia. The whole county only had 40,000 residents. And everyone knew how to do a lot of things. In my family, it was cars. We could 
take down an engine and transmission, put it back blindfolded. We knew everything about cars. That was our passion and my buddy's passions. But other friends learned carpentry and plumbing and electricity. So they didn't call in a plumber, electrician. They could do it themselves or a relative would do it. So the, the service industries were not booming, but the craft industries were. People knew how to make quilts. And, people, and, and it was interesting. I've never shared this before. But my first book that I wrote was called uh, Parkersburg and Early Portrait. I was only 16 years old. And I decided to write this book because I found that the older people in my hometown had this tremendous amount of knowledge. And it, it was passed down by the, by the written statement and word. So I got a buddy of mine, Jim Dawson, who became a well-known and respected author. And we went out to do this book, having no experience at all, but just deciding we're going to start with the oldest people in the entire county. So we would find out from churches, who's your oldest resident, et cetera. And these were people in their 80s and 90s. And we would sit with them, and they were all only too happy to share this with us. And they would bring up boxes of photographs from the 1800s. In fact, one person that we interviewed, in fact, one of the oldest people that we interviewed, uh, she was nearly 100, and that was an exception. Most people died in their 60s because of smoking and drinking. She had never smoked or drank. She lived on a farm. She had all these quilts all over her house that she made, was still making quilts. She's still very active. And I, I was young. I was a teenager, and I was just curious. So I asked her, are you afraid of dying? And she just looked at me, and she smiled. She said, we're all going to have that experience. But if you've lived a life without fear, you will not fear dying. You only fear dying when you fear not living an authentic life for your own life. That stuck with me to this day. And I find it to be one of those truisms. In any case, when you think back, she was born around the time of the Civil War. I'm thinking, whoa. And then her father's father fought in one of the early American wars. And you're thinking, wow, I'm sitting talking with someone and there is just two steps back and look where you are. And so everyone gave photographs and everyone had stories. But everyone said the same thing. The single most important virtue in life is to have a family you love who loves you and allows you to be able to be yourself and be supportive of that. I found that true all over the world. So what does that mean? It means that we have lost one of the single most important elements of life, the life energy force of support through family, through traditions, and those traditions can change. Not all traditions are good or healthy, but most help keep a family, a community cohesive. And so nobody feared dying that I met because they had to head up an honorable life. They weren't famous. They didn't do anything that got headlines. They were just good people. As a result, in my community, no one ever locked a door. No one ever locked a car. There was no stealing. There's no murders. There'd be an occasional problem, someone getting drunk, but nothing serious. Because people respected themselves. They lived through a sense of character and morals and ethics. But I found that all over the world. But I also found all over the world when I finally, after it took me five years, I put together a chart. And my first chart was called What Contributes to a Longer, Healthier Lifespan? Yes, if you took a really good diet, I mean the best possible diet, a healthy plant-based diet with all the right fibers and, and plant-based proteins and all the essential fatty acids and oils, and uh, you put it all together, that counts for about 15%. If you take exercise on a really good uh, routine where you're doing both aerobic and resistance, let's say you're, you're moving at least 10 to 20,000 steps a day, that counts for about 15. If you're able to deal with stress and all of its different variations, so you don't become overwhelmed, ridden with uh, uh, acute anxiety or depression, uh, that counts for about 15. Now, mind you, I was also working with Dr. Alan Putterman and Dr. Uh, Martin Shepard and Dr. Carmi Harari and Dr. Donald Mullen, Dr. Albert Ellis, Dr. Lane Kahn, 
And most of those were my close personal friends. So we would have weekly meetings about what role does stress play in a person's life? Well, I had to go to the father of all stress research in American history, Hans Selye. And we had long talks. And Dr. Lawrence Lachan, who said, what you put your energy into manifests in the body. And to prove that, he was the first in America to do this. He took 25, uh, excuse me, he took 500 women who had no breast cancer in their family history. And yet, based upon conversations with him, he predicted with high degree of accuracy which of those women would develop breast cancer based upon the following. Did they feel appreciated or not appreciated? Was all their efforts at being responsible for other people taken for granted? Did they have this sense of frustration and angst about I'm doing all this for everyone else and no one seems to care about me? They were the ones most likely to get cancer. Later, a, a city a city of New York psychiatrist heading that whole division, a man named Kessler, uh, came over to the Institute of Applied Biology. We had these same conversations. He picked up on Lawrence Lachan's work. Carrie DeFord also agreed. What you think about, you can manifest literally through epigenetics in our body, meaning epi, the larger environment you're in and everyone in it and all the message you're getting can impact how your genes express themselves. You can turn on your immune system. You can turn off your immune system. You can be very bright and act stupid. You can be very kind and act very selfish and mean-spirited, all because of whatever energy is dominant. If you have a positive energy in your mind and you apply it positively, then the negative energies are suppressed. Hence, the dark side doesn't show itself. The light side does. And we all have both dark and light sides. We all have unresolved conflicts. And in other cultures, they work on those conflicts. They work on what doesn't work. They have to because the life of the community, the individual, is frequently determined by, do you, did you learn your lessons or not? And so here I found that if you had a really good diet and you were dealing with stress appropriately and you were exercising, that counted for about 45%. Throw in proper supplementation and it's about another 5%. So now you're 50%. And yet Americans were saying that if you want to be healthy, you got to do these four things. And the whole health movement was based upon do those four things, diet, exercise, stress management. Nobody talked about your belief systems. So when I did what I found all over the world and in the United States, especially in older people, was what do you value? What allows you to feel good about waking up today? What do you put your energy in? And so when you become really focused upon doing the right thing for the right reason, <clears throat> when you then get the five principles I put together, the right support system, there's your family and friends, teachers, the right, uh, the, the right time, the right place, and be the right person with the right idea, you harmonize. The energy just flows. You're able to live like Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell danced and begin to begin. If you have never seen that, you want to see perfection, watch that. It's only a four minute clip. Begin the begin with Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell. But a lot of people get one or two of those right, but not the others. You got to have them all to go forward. Otherwise we can inspire ideas in our others, but not necessarily ourselves. We're a better teacher than we are a student. We'll help other people where we won't help ourselves. And having that belief in yourself and living an authentic, moral, ethical, conscious life allows everything to go forward. And in my work, in my whole history of my entire career being in anti-aging medicine, that's what made the difference in people who were able to overcome diseases and live a longer life the completeness of our value system. What do we believe in? And today, people have lost faith in a lot of things because they've been betrayed. A lot of institutions have betrayed them. We have fractured and balkanized much of our traditions for political or for ideological reasons. We have people hating one another, fighting one another, and that doesn't lead to a longer and healthier life. 
leads to a highly stressed life. So finally, people just say, enough, I'm just one person. I can't even survive today. If you're one of 200 million Americans, you can't write a check for $500, it'll bounce. You have debt up the gazoot and no relief in sight. So they become apathetic. They get angry, then apathetic, depressed, and frequently suicide, or they just destroy themselves. We had 100,000 people die last year from drug overdose, throwing suicide, and it's our beliefs right now that have to be realigned and brought back to what it should be, that we have to go through other parts of the world and back through history to see this. Because it's not in the current vernacular, we're not talking about it. But I wanted to share that with you today. So see if it makes sense to you. If it does, good. Then use it. If it doesn't, then don't use it. I'll always have more material. Go to GaryAndAll.com and see all the different things. Approaching a thousand articles written, over a hundred documentaries, over a hundred books. Uh, nearly 50,000 hours of broadcasting, and especially when you hear something really good, go to prn.live and look under the archives for the Progressive Commentary Hour and also um, the conversation through Remarkable Minds. Thank you for watching. Please share it with other people and have a nice day. If you would like to stay updated and see more content, you can follow PRN on Twitter at live.prn and YouTube at Progressive Radio Network. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you again for listening to PRN, the home of progressive voices.